Hello and welcome to the podcast and I'm very excited today. Well, I'm always excited. I'm always excited because I love doing podcasts, but today I have a doctor with me and we like we're partial to the odd doctor on the podcast. So, um I'm joined today by um, Dr. Rob Lowe, who is the founder of Relational Schools and also the CEO of the Relationships Foundation. Could that be any more resonant, resonant with my passion of relationships? Good morning, Rob. Good morning. Yeah, I noticed, Lisa, in your bio, you call yourself a relational activist. I'd love to know what one of those is, because I tell you what, um, yeah, in our world, we, we, we probably could do with more of them. So I was excited to see that. You are totally a relational activist. <laughs> um, I mean, it's really interesting. And I hope that, you know, um, the people that I mentioned do get to listen to the podcast. But um, that's the work of Tim Fisher and Becca Dove who wrote for the RSA on relational activism and one day on Twitter said to me, um, this is relational activism, something that I was describing that I was doing. And I just thought, oh my God, that reminds me of being 16 and hearing the word feminist for the first time. And I was just like, oh, that's what I am. And it was kind of like that when they said relational activists, I just thought, yes, that is exactly um, that resonates so deeply with me. So do look up more stuff around relational oh, activism. Okay. So Rob, God, I don't know where to start really. Um, you recently had your first conference. So I'm going to sort of start there because um, what led you, what led you from where you began to where you are here, where you're hosting your first conference with an organization that's been around for 25 years, um, pulling people together to talk about relationships. So, um, yeah, so I started, I, I studied, um, I did a joint tennis degree in education studies, which is really education policy here in Cambridge in the late 90s. And I studied English literature and drama as well. Um, and so I studied the psychology, sociology, history and philosophy of education. Um, and at the end of it, having graduated in 2001, I was offered a PhD, which I turned down much the horror of this professor um, because it was my view and I know this won't be shared by everybody so this is a personal view but I struggle with um, teachers being told to be how to be teachers by people who've never been teachers and I and so therefore I asked to enroll in their PhD course because I really wanted to be a teacher so I then became an English teacher faculty head of English assistant head of sixth form and then assistant principal of the college over the other side in various Edmonds, about 30 miles from where I live. Um, and I did that for the best part of sort of 15 years um, until one evening I went to listen to a public lecture um, given by the founder of our organisation, a guy called Dr. Michael Schluter. I shouldn't have even gone. Um, I went as a favour to a friend um, because the talk was on economics um, and it's not my field. Um, but he in that lecture spoke about all the work of the Relationships Foundation, starting with prisons in Scotland, an absolutely beautiful piece of research. We did, I say we now, because it's, it's, it's our foundation, I, I run it. Um, we did in, um, in a prison just northwest of Glasgow. And it's still, so I understand from the Chief Inspector of Prisons for Scotland, the only prison in, in the UK where prisoners and staff eat communally every day, safely. Wow. Now, I'd love to be challenged on that. And if that's not true, uh, uh, you know, I, I'll happily receive the challenge. But I was really suddenly struck by that. And then he spoke about work in, in the NHS, in peace building contexts, pre-truth and reconciliation in South Africa, post-conflict Rwanda. Um, currently doing a track two piece of diplomacy work in, in Korea on the peninsula. Um, and he, he spoke about working sort of businesses, all these kinds of environments to try and make relationships within them and between them, you know, healthier, more robust. But he made mm -hmm. a throwaway comment at the end. He said that, but we'd never done anything in schools before. We never found anybody to do, a, do that for us. And so I ran up to him afterwards and, and suddenly within a year, I'd left my perfectly secure job as an assistant head. And that was six years ago. We founded Relational Schools Project, as was. Um, and it had grown such that, I mean, Relational School started working with about 20 students in Cambridgeshire and our la largest project today is, has been in Australia where we work with tens of thousands of children. I mean, I think we've measured something like 50,000 relationships in, in Australian schools alone, um, huge study in Canada at the moment. 
you know, in massive growth. And Relational Schools was about to spin out as its own charity. Um, but then my predecessor um, retired last year. And so the trustees invited me to spin Relational Schools into the foundation. And, and now Relational Schools, whilst has its own brand and energy, is, is effectively a division of the Relationships Foundation. And we are growing our work again in prison, in justice context, in youth justice context, I mean, healthcare again. Our portfolio of work is growing um, broader and broader. Um, so the, the conference, um, it's, it's clearly not the first conference that RF has, has been engaged in, but it's the first time we've run a, an annual conference like that, where we've said, let's celebrate the last 25 years and all the amazing things we've done, you know, all the amazing organisations we've incubated. Um, I mean, some, some extraordinary charities, one, one of which um, we, we have our home in. So um, we, we have our home in, a, in, a, in an office called the Future Business Centre in Cambridge. It's run by a charity called Alia and they used to be called City Life. We started those 20 years ago. And the purpose of Alia um, or City Life then was to provide um, money for housing and employment and um, through social bonds. So you'd encourage people to, wealthy people to give money into a high yield bond for a period of five years. And basically the interest from that bond, instead of going to the wealthy person, will go to the charity. And at the end of the bond, the wealthy person get their money back and the charity had benefited from all the interest of the bond. And Ali have done a, half a billion of those now. They have four social incubation spaces in Cambridgeshire, Peterborough and London. You know, they're a most extraordinary charity. And that's what RF has been. It's been this incubating organisation. It said, we've got a really good idea to try and encourage people in communities and within the organisations and communities to have better relationship and be in better relationship. My vision for the next 25 years is for us to be far more focused again on the research that creates those ideas. And that's what the conference is about. It was about drawing together practitioners, academics, thinkers, doers, um, to start and build momentum. Um, I, do you know what? There was a number of people on the day who, at the end of the day, who said, I, I, I can really see a movement coming from this. But, you know, I make no presumptions about that. Movements will make their own mind up. It's not right for me to start a movement. That's impossible. I think we're in a movement. I think we're yeah. in a movement. I think yeah. that's, that's yeah. happening. There's lots of us in that space. And I think that is an antithesis to what we're being presented with at, uh, as an alternative way of living that is absolutely not about relationships that's incredibly divisive and destructive so that I often think and, 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 and I've said before on the podcast you know that that is a fantastic mirror for us and an opportunity for us to look at what we don't want and what we are not going to be. Yeah no I totally agree um, so you know so it's we're, we're always keen to try and be the servants of other people in that movement we don't see ourselves as the um the hero of the story we see ourselves as the guide and so there are plenty of people who we've worked with we've helped publish we've helped start a consultancy you know there's all sorts of people that are actors in that space but what we're bringing to it which which no one else has and this is the thing that makes rf unique is our ability to measure the quality of human relationships and that's the thing that we genuinely have pioneered over the last 25 years to the point where i mm. truly believe we're the world leaders in that and and sometimes i think it's rather sad that you have to put empirical numbers or or try and quantify something so beautifully human but in a culture where we tend not to manage the things we don't measure we've felt the need to to really yeah to to, to change the debate through through big data um, and, mm. and so that's what we that's what we do I saw that um, I spotted that and saw that you had um, what might be described of as quite an academic approach to relationship but before we move on to that yeah, sure. I just would like to say that what you're describing is something that I very much subscribe to and talk about which is the interdisciplinary yeah. um, nature of how we think about um, relationships yeah. and how we think about making things better but but on top of that in that kind of layering is also like yourself I work across every sector 
um, health, criminal justice, education, social care. And that as well really works in my mind because we've spent so long being in these silos, this idea that we are health, this idea that we are in need of social care or we go in into education. You know, it's very, very fragmented and we just don't operate like that. I mean, that strikes me as quite a westernised view that sits comfortably with the idea that the mind and body are somehow separate. It's that whole binary thinking, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that um, that is certainly true. Where we started, you know, when relational proximity is a concept, which is a measure of the distance between two individuals. When that, when was that was first described and set out, the idea of it was to try and unify all sorts of thinking and academic research from you know fields like anthropology, sociology, game theory. You know, all of those have their accounts of what relationships are and aren't, and um, and their view of them. And what what my predecessors were trying to do was take all of that wisdom and then turn it into one model, as it were. One we think about the, the model a, a little bit like a prism that you have one penetrating beam that is relationships that we then try and break down into their constituent parts so that they're knowable you know observable tangible and measurable um but latterly you know it's very clear that there are there's new thinking and there's there's new approaches and it's right that we recognize that and 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 reach out to those people who are thinking differently about relationships because our model can, it's not that we want to rethink completely our model, but we definitely want to learn from other people. And so when, you know, when I see work by you and others in the field of trauma, for example, and you know, our, our, just our knowledge and understanding of social neuroscience in particular has grown so much in the last two decades that it's right now that we, we're at a point now where we're ready to learn again. I mean, you know, the conference was was opened by Professor Gordon Harold's done all this fabulous work in epigenetics. And, you know, that that field in and of itself tells us enormous amounts about relationships that we didn't know 10 years ago. And now we do. And what we're trying to do is once again, yeah, engage, learn um, and adapt um, mm. based that on that community practice. Yeah, and I mean that that's hopefully that's where anybody worth their salt is at, that we're always um thinking about things, learning about things. I mean, the you know, you brought in neuroscience and the stuff we didn't know twenty five years ago. Well, quite frankly, we didn't know ten years ago and certainly didn't necessarily incorporate into the work that we're doing. I mean, if I think back to when I started um really embedding the language of trauma and adversity and um neuroscience probably maybe five or six years ago and it was like being certainly going into schools or something it was like being like in the desert you know there was it and now most people in in most no actually would it be most people many people in many organizations across all the sectors have at least heard of that language, that way of thinking about um, humans and that way of that lens through which to understand distress and human experience with relationships firmly at the heart of the healing of those yeah. things. Um, well, was, yeah, yeah, totally. And that was my personal sort you understand. So I, I didn't have a particularly, you know, I, I, yeah, I found relationship building at school very difficult and um you know and and contemplated leaving school early um uh after after a period of um yeah bullying and um but it was true to say that whilst relationships were almost the thing that saw me leave school they were definitely the sort the thing that saw me stay and flourish you know fabulous teachers a new peer group that i that the, the school themselves encouraged me to engage with you know they took i call it a bit of a relational skin graft now you know they they took firm and you know clear steps to remove me from one group of of, of peers and, and encouraged me to build relationships with another group of peers um so that they were so so when you say that relationships can can be a healer that that is absolutely true and and you know, from from everything we know from the last, well, you only have to go to 
Susan Pinker's work in the Village Effect, Helen Pearson's work in the Life Project, the Harvard Adult Development Survey. If you want to pay attention to one thing in, in our lives um, that can determine health, happiness, academic success, then, then it is the quality of our relationships. Um, and, and our work shows, you know, that the seat of you know, good well-being in young people is usually one robust friendship with another peer or one robust relationship with another teacher. And, and it's as simple as that. You don't necessarily need to be friends with 50 people. Um, it's, it's perhaps how we define social capital in relation to relational capital, you know, that one is mm. the sort of how many people do I know? And the other is, or what is the collective value of the people I know? Um, and all the literature tells us it's just one person that we need to be in good relationship with. And if we can have that, then it, the, the, the benefits of it psychologically and physically now, and you know, we know all sorts about the ways in which the quality of our relationship can turn off and on our gene responses to certain cancers. We know its impact, positive impact on dementia rates, all these kinds of things. We know the restorative and healing power of good relationships. And our job is to try and encourage organisations and individuals to set systems and process and structures which enable those relationships to thrive. So people beautiful, beautiful. That. What makes that, I guess, a little bit murky in 21st century Britain is, of course, this idea that we know lots and lots and lots of people because we're online yes. and, and, and that and really helping perhaps perhaps not those of us that are a bit older, but maybe younger people to be able to differentiate between having 1300 friends on Facebook yeah. um, and having those high quality relationships that really make a difference. And and I mean, I, so I th I'm just thinking, you know, how do we, by building in the structures that you're describing, in a way, you don't even have to make that explicit because that feeling place, if you've got the, the spaces created that enable high quality, uh, real life, offline relationships to flourish and grow, mm. then hopefully that helps young people without actually having to be explicit about it to understand the difference between high quality or offline relationships and low quality potentially high quantity relationships online i mean what what's your thoughts around yeah, that no, i totally agree with that so and i think that 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 sits at the heart of how we define relationships so we take our cue you know when we think about interpersonal relationships we take our cue from somebody like they um, the Cambridge academic Robert Hind, who talks about um, relationships being a series of interactions, such that each interaction of the past um, builds an anticipation of interactions in the future. Um, Lovely, otherwise, yeah. you'll continue just bumping into strangers. Now, the fundamental five principles that we say that lead to that knowledge of other, and as I said, our, our, me our measure is of of the of the closeness of two individuals that we say that good relationships exist when you have lots of face-to-face -face communication and all the social neuroscience says that without face-to-face -face communication everything else that is mediated will never really have the same benefits psychologically and physically on us that we need to build a story of our relationship so as i said a sense of where that relationship is rooted and a continued anticipated sense that you want to build on it invest in it that you anticipate you'll see that person in the future that it needs to be built in many contexts so we have to know people not just in one primary context but over over several so why lots of our work in schools is um, is designed to encourage and engage in the research behind the impact of extracurricular or co-curricular activity and we've for years said well why is it that PE teachers or drama teachers or art teachers or music teachers or D Duke of Edinburgh staff have better relationships with young people this anecdotal picture that, that and it's it's primarily because they know them in all these different contexts they see them they've experienced different things together and their relationship is enriched we call it the multiplexity of relationship it's a rather ugly word but it but it means the multi the many strands of it so the more context you know someone in the more you know about them so like a rope your your relationship will be many stranded and robust 
we say that there has to be parity in a relationship, the perception of equality in the relationship. So even where the relationship is asymmetrical, you've got to, in a good relationship, and a teacher will do this, a great teacher, even though a, a young person might know that one person sets the rules and the other person obeys them, the great teacher makes a young person feel that they are on the same level. And lastly, that's built on common values, which are shared, co-created, um, and with a, with a good deal more time spent on trying to identify the things that you agree about than disagree about. Um, and that's certainly something as a country, I think we, we are very, very good. We are very good at, at continually sharing and affirming the things we all disagree about. And it's no wonder that we feel such fracture, fissure, um, across society here. So those five things create what we call relational proximity when they're present, and they are completely dichotomous to a, a, a Facebook, and I don't use that um, term in a derogatory way. Um, I just, it's, a, it's obviously a symbol for that kind of online connection, but it is dichotomous with your 1500 links on LinkedIn, um, your, your, your tens of thousands of people who follow you on Twitter, you know, I like to think that I know you, Lisa, but I don't know you. You know, I've followed you on Twitter for a long time. I've engaged your podcast. I've seen many of the things you write about. So I feel I know of you, um, but I don't know you. And there's no way that we could say that we knew each other until, A, we've had a go at meeting sort of face-to-face -face today, although this is done online, but we wouldn't know each other until we'd had several meetings over time, um, and in different contexts. And that's why, you know, we, that's why we have people around our houses for dinner. That's why you, you go on holiday with family. You, you, you practice all these things within family, um, but we assume that we can shortcut cut them in, in, in friendship. Um, mm. And of we course learned, we can't. You know, the, best, yeah, if you, the best way to make friends when you're younger, if, you, if your parents, if they, were, if they wanted you to be friends with somebody, they'd invite somebody over for tea. That's, yeah. you know, yes because they recognise you can build one kind of relationship in school and quite another one where you, you do it in your home and break some what, Was it Mayor Angelou who said, um, you learn a lot about a person by what they do with an umbrella in the rain? Uh, and, and, I love, and I love that. I'm pretty sure that was her. I'm going to have to go and dig the crow town now. But um, what I think that tells us is that actually it's when we are with people who are managing difficult things or experiencing distress how quickly they recover from that what they need from the other person to recover from that these are the kind of the details of relationship and i, and I love that idea of um you know if we're not always moving forward each time we meet somebody in some way we're continuously meeting a stranger yeah. was I think what you were saying and that's right and I and I really like that because that really is clear about the detail of how we build something and how we grow something and I know for me the deepest relationships I've had across my life have been when something really awful has happened in my life and I've needed you know people kind of then go into a whole other depth in those relationships that create the more long lasting because of course what we haven't really explored is in that relational process how do we look at things like longevity so you'll know for example that two passions of mine one of one we share which is school exclusion and the other one uh, is looked after children mm -hmm. and this this notion then about what happens to those children across the life course in terms of longevity of relationship the people who knew you when you were a child, the people who knew you when you didn't have the skills to do anything other than where you were in your development, you know, those people who, who walked some of that, those miles of life with you. So I'm interested on in your thoughts about that. Yeah, so um, it would be of no surprise to you that the reason we started to think cross sector um, was after we began a project this May, um, which we call our integrated project and it is a study of um, alternative provision in England. Our aim is to try and measure relationships if we can in all alternative provision in England. We know that's a tough, a tough thing to ask but then what we're seeking to do is then work with 10 alternative provision in England 
whom we consider to be the outliers. And they're, they'll be outliers because you'll have young people within those um, contexts where they've been excluded to, who have come from um, significant disadvantage, um, either material or relational disadvantage, um, and yet go on to, to experience good relationship again and thrive after they leave AP. I was visiting AP in London only last year and I visited their sick form provision and there were individuals who got, you know, um, unconditional offers for universities to study art and it was clear that they were going to have a life beyond. This was a sign of, you know, what the Greeks called eudaimonia. This is, this is true human flourishing. And yet this environment was semi-secure, gates were locked, um, you know, these guys were in, as it were, and yet they've got a future out. And so we're looking for those environments where relationships have been the driving force for those young people to get back on the road again, knowing that they, that they can be restorative in those, in those moments. And what's so fascinating about that, just to speak to your, to your point, is that when we interviewed some of those students last year in, in that particular London-based alternative provision, one of the key questions I asked a number of them was, um, tell me about the difference between um, the environment you're in now and the one you're excluded from. What's the key difference between those two places? And universally, they said one thing that really stuck with me, which is, here we feel known. Um, and it doesn't surprise me that, you know, there are many schools up and down the country that are, you know, deeply personal organisations where children are treated um, as an end in themselves and not a means to an end. They're placed of what the philosopher Stern calls affirming institutional memories. But many of them are not. They are social norms. They're in personal places where children are teached as a, as, a, as a means to an end. And it's in those places where, and we've, we've gone in and measured lots of schools in the United Kingdom where relationships are like that, where, where children sit with each other every day. They, they speak often, but they say nothing. You know, they really do. It is like being in a room of strangers. And, and then when you show back the data to these classes and you see... These, these distinctive groupings in classes where people are individuals or pockets of groups or where there's two halves. One of the most embarrassing moments when I was overseeing a survey once was um, a, young, a young pupil who put their hand up and said, I'm really sorry, your survey is wrong. Um, this student is listed that I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be answering your survey on. Um, she's not in this class. And then the teacher came over to the student and said, actually, it, it, it's that little girl. It, it's that girl in the corner over there. And they'd been in the class for three years together. Wow. And, and, and he didn't even know this person was in the class, let alone know her name, let alone know her, know her. That's and incredible. The teacher must have been mortified, actually, mortified. because hopefully in that moment they understood that something had gone horribly wrong in how they had developed and made any kind of inclusivity in that classroom, that something had gone amiss. But, and, I, and I suppose that for the majority, I mean, you know, for the majority of our, our teachers, and I was a teacher for a long time, you know, and, and stuck in that system. And I, I want to be really clear, I didn't leave it because I didn't like it. I love teaching. I certainly wasn't driven out because I wasn't good at it. I, I was, but I... Um, when you're so laser focused yeah. on an individual and their individual attainment, you know, this is about, you know, let's be really clear. School is about my world, my life, my grade. It is not set up as a team endeavor. And so a, a teacher's job as they perceive it, and quite rightly, is not, is not to create this kind of cohesive, unified, inclusive classroom environment. Their job is to get these young people's individually through a series of, of baffles, of hurdles, in order to make their way to the, to the next step. And so in that world, these, these people look like individuals. And we know from the work of Jonathan Haidt, you know, in, in, his, in his sort of, um, you know, in his theory about human hives, how we really generate eusociality or hyper-social behaviours. The one thing you never encourage people to do is compete as individuals 
only to compete as teams. When you get people to compete with individuals, you'll start to see communities and societies breaking down. But I think which is where is, we are. Is, again, You've just right, described we, that complete <laughs> neoliberal agenda, haven't you? You know that we are living in and living out. And I wonder if it's time now for schools. And I was going to get onto secondary schools with you in terms of their ability and the way they're set up to actually do this but if we're going to change society do you not think that it's time to think about schools in a different way and to create schools that are community focused that are about building teams that are about sustainability in terms of longevity of relationships that do offer an opportunity to really build and grow and work together are we not ready for that yet so I think that um, ironically within that sort of neoliberal system as you describe it, you know, actually one of the I, one of the ironically beautiful things is that within the free schools movement, you start to see some schools pop up, you know, as really alternative models um, within that system that are doing just that. So there's one school we did a lot of research in. You can go to our website and it's not a plug. I just just implore you to go and watch watch the film we made and called We Are Crew and the research report we we wrote about the XP school in Doncaster, which is built on the expeditionary learning model in America. It's Kurt Hahn, it's Outward Bound, um, and Harvard Graduate School of Education. The first collaboration with them and the two guys who run that, these two lovely Doncaster lads who set up this school, have built a school based entirely on those principles and um, they're built on human scale values so the school community is no larger than 350 which means a year group is no larger than 50 and we know from again from the work of another Cambridge academic I'm not being biased here you understand but if you look at the work of Robin Dunbar and his work what, what he called the Dunbar number we know that our brains um, are structured such that we really struggle to be in communities larger than 150. It's why we call that the Dunbar number. So here's 50 pupils in a year group, here's 350 in total. And when they wanted to double the size of the school, what did they do? They built a school next door to it. So they have XP and XP East. So they might have 700 students all, all, always separated into communities and tight communities, pastoral tutor groups of no, no larger than one to 13 in ratio. And they spend mm -hmm. four 45 minutes at the beginning of every day. They are embedded in their community. All their curriculum has that kind of um, outward facing, community engaged focus to it. Everything they do as a school is designed to support in some way or talk to, speak to, or speak for the community around them to help them to nurture them and to be a good presence within them. Their whole community structure is designed to make people be in good relationship and you know the, I've never seen an Ofsted report so effusive ever and really personalized in a way that you don't usually see. Ofsted recognized what an extraordinary school it was. Academic performance of the students is really good you know um, it can be done and it's just very difficult to break down some of our schools now which have become huge I mean 1500 2000 mm. growing that uh, and there are certain principles that I think that we'll, we'll never see that community feel unless we understand how we break down some of those big impersonal structures within this system. Well, I'd like everyone to go and watch that video. And of course, uh, the, of course, I'm, you're on the podcast, so we want everyone to know where to find you. <laughs> so um, I, and I will go and watch that video. It sounds fantastic. And, and you know, leads us on neatly to thinking about the challenge of secondary schools you just described schools with 1500 pupils in there are schools with 2000 I'm, I'm told oh, um, yeah yeah um and i think one of the things that i kind of ponder regularly uh, especially when i'm training a, say a cluster group and i've got mixed primary and secondary um one of the things that i think about often um and i certainly don't have the overview that you have is how how set up are most secondary schools uh, for now i would be looking at that through a trauma-informed lens but it's still a relational approach um, and an attachment aware approach yep. to um to relieving distress and supporting learning for all students um, are secondary schools set up for that because I've been into many that just to me feel like it would be almost like having to scrap the system 
and start again to create an environment that had that truly relational opportunity um, that the, the type that we're talking about that high quality stuff that creates a difference mm -hmm. so I, uh, that is certainly um, certainly something we've observed as well um, I think one of the things because I used to be head of teaching and learning my last school and one of the things that really struck me um, is how often we misuse the word pedagogy um, in schools so our very notion of the sort of well, pe pedagogy often used or misused as a kind of science of teaching uh, or a proxy for that. But, but, you know, as the Greeks, you know, described it and, and the way that they used that word, pe pedagogy was not a subject discipline. It was not a, it was not a, it was not a, di a discipline in and of itself. It, pedagogues were people and they were distinctive from teachers of the day. And what the Greeks recognised fundamentally that you needed two sorts of people in your life, that you needed somebody to instruct you and you needed somebody to be your mentor and guide, somebody to literally walk by you, to, you know, to, to carry your bags, to, um, to really carry some of that load and to be with you at all steps of the way to really help you grow spiritually, morally, culturally, that there was, there was two purposes to education. And from what I see, and unhelpfully so on Twitter, and it's why I rarely engage in the debate, what I see is, is two camps of people rowing about which one of those it should be. Um, whether it should be the instruction of people in, in, in a subject discipline or whether it should be um, the, the social and emotional development of them as individual people. And the answer is both. You know, I'm not some sort of Luddite. I recognise that people go to school um, in order to become literate, to be numerate, to learn how to and um, to develop intellectually. But it's one thing to, for us to teach young people to be clever and it's quite something else to, for us to teach them to be wise and wisdom and cleverness are not the same thing. And, um, and so what I see in the worst examples, where a school, if, you, if you're one of those head teachers today who's, who's, who's begun the year by thinking that you can do away with your pastoral structures because they're a waste of 15 minutes at the beginning, the, end, at the, beginning of the day, or, or unfortunately where finance are meant that mentoring time and some schools used to, you know, at a time when they were financially more healthy, used to invest heavily in teachers having um, you know, allotted periods in their timetable to be with young people, to meet with them. And some of the reasons those things were scrapped is that we often lack a kind of impact evidence framework to understand whether that's really working. From my perspective, however, they are the kind of fundamental principles of having one person who knows you really well, um, who, who cares about your trajectory across all your subjects, who you feel you can go to. It's why the Americans, Canadians, they call that space the pastoral tutor room. They call it the home room. Um, and they call it the home room. It's a much better name because it is the place that you can you can go when things are rough. It's the place that you always know that you can go back to. It's your kind of steady ship. And as I said, you know, philosopher Stern, Julian Stern from York University described the great relational schools as being like households. Um, you know, these places that are co-created where people are there subordinating self-interest for each other, where they are literally there for each other. But that is not to negate the power of what school is there to do in, in order to enable young people to flourish and succeed academically. I just don't think these things are competing priorities. They are both mutually reinforcing and absolutely vital, the pair of them. Yeah, I could. I mean, you put that so succinctly and, and I absolutely agree. I mean, I, they're not discussions I get involved in on Twitter either um, because they're they're a symptom of actually how we're looking at just about everything, which is it's this or it's that, it's there or it's here, you know, that the, the muddy waters of oneness are just really very difficult um, culturally in our society right now. And, 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 and I suppose if I was to argue anything, I would say that it's been this, this continuing heightened obsession with the individual that, that has created Undoubtedly this. true. Yeah. yeah and, I totally agree with that. Yeah, and, but you know, in, but back to your question, which is around secondary schooling. So can secondary schools be big? Well, of course they can be big. They can, they can be big. And, and you can understand why a government necessitates some schools to grow because where they see success, they feel that those schools can grow. Um, but, I've only, but it only ever works if a school is committed to 
um, understanding how to break down that large environment so that children can still feel known. Um, mm. And, you know, what we find in our research, and this is true in Australia, we haven't tested this at scale in the UK yet, but uh, for every um, class you add at a year level, relationships tend to degrade within every class by about 4%. And that starts to have an exponential effect. And that's because, of course, the larger a year group gets, the less you're likely to bump into each other, the less you're likely to have those series of interactions, um, as Robert Hines says. And so what we notice in, in schools where they have year groups of up to 300 and more, actually the, um, the, the, the tail off tends to come somewhere around the thousand mark. So um, we see um, schools that are below a thousand students tend to have quite good relationships everything up around the 1400 mark schools start to really struggle to create those cohesive um you know uh, social environments between children it's not to say that it can't be achieved but every time you grow like that it necessitates some kind of structural barrier that will always impede relationship and not encourage it so what we're trying to do is is build a sort of portfolio of evidence of the best schools that have overcome that or the best models and we and obviously we're interested in doing that internationally um, because we don't have all the answers here. Yeah, and that um, when you were talking about that mentorship as well, which I guess isn't even as deep as having and you know relationships that are attachment aware, but that mentorship is I ha I don't see that model very much over here. It's very much a model in America um through university and through workplaces and the way that people are mentored into their careers by wise uh, sages who've been around a long time and i've been thinking a lot about this in terms of social work teams schools we've i've seen a lot and i don't have any evidence uh, to put to put forward on this but what i'm i hear a lot about anecdotally and i've seen is that teens are losing a lot of experience. So what you tend to have are very newly qualified, heavy people in teams. And I've been really sort of thinking about where is the mentorship opportunity in that? How is that wonderful wisdom that um, starts to formulate probably after you know 20 years or so of, of work? how is that shared and utilized and used so that more less experienced and younger members of of teams can really feel that they can bring their own way of doing things their more contemporary way of doing things based on the more recent education along with that experience and knowledge and wisdom that somebody with a few yeah. decades brings to the party is that is that something you've thought about or that you've seen or um, no, not, not, not really. I mean, only in the case, as I said, in the best example where we saw it done at XP school with this, this um, really committed approach to homeroom as well. They call it crew. They call it crew because, of course, um, no one at the school is a passenger. Everybody's involved in the life of the ship um, and, and therefore no one is left behind. So, you know, some of these things that others might see them as being quite trite, you know, they wear these wristbands, we are crew, but there is no, there's no platitudes here. The, you know, these students speak, uh, you know, really powerfully about what this means to them, their part in it. Um, and, um, and, and within the staff room that creates that, what you notice is a commitment to the same practices that they encourage amongst the students. So when new staff are culturally onboarded, they go on the same expedition the students go on. So one of the things that drew me to the school in the first place is the fact that they don't start school in the normal way, but they all get on a bus day one. They don't even go in the school building. It's day one, we're going on a bus into the Welsh mountains and we're not coming back home until we feel like a family. Now, they do that with teachers as well. So when teachers culturally on board to the school, those teachers go away for a week as well and they don't come back until they feel a committed part of the staff and what i and what i saw and observed in that school was a was a was a staff group who were as tight and as um, supportive and protective of each other as the student community was that it was a model relationship in every aspect of the culture that then was passed down shared 
experienced mm. and, and replicated. Um, so as I said, we have seen it in some examples, just not many. Mm. I think that's something I'd really like to be encouraging people to think about in their staff teams, that sort of mentoring opportunity um, and the sharing of wisdom. And I was just thinking as well about something you were saying earlier about the extracurricular activities that you know offer an opportunity to build and layer those really important relationships and those becoming known and seeing people in different ways but also again through a trauma-informed lens these are informal what I might call informal interventions that not only build relationships but but certain activities are very helpful in terms of embedding um, adaptation within the body and integrating the things that have happened to us you know that mind body experience um being being used as a healing opportunity through sport through music through drama all of those things so it's multi-layered so I'm, I'm i'm loving the layers and even with the different lenses we're speaking about exactly the same things um yeah. indeed so where can people find you rob so um so there's there's they can find me on twitter um uh, at robert underscore low um just be careful not to, to, to go to the New Zealand basketball um, uh, <laughs> champion. Uh, he's, he is also Robert Lowe, L-O-E. Um, he's very good. And, also, and interestingly, also born, born in Leicester, which is, so I find really ironic. So there were two Robert Lowe's knocking around pretty much in the same geography for some time. Uh, you can find um, us at uh, Relational School, so www.relationalschools.org. And now, as we try to unify this world uh, cross-sector at relationshipsfoundation.org, um, where you'll learn lots about our history and, and, and some of our plans for the future. That's wonderful. Rob, thank you so much for such an interesting conversation that I hope has inspired many. Um, and I look forward to being invited to your family home for dinner. You'd be more than welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Pleasure.